It's the bird emergency. I'm Grant Williams. I'm the bird nerd who has no special talent at all and no great scientific background. As I remind you frequently, dear listener, my science background is in horticulture, not in ornithology. And that's why I seek out people like today's guest, Mr. Kevin Bergio, who calls himself a integrative ecologist with a special interest in disturbance, climate change, habitat loss. But Kevin is the Director of Conservation and Science at the New York City chapter of the Audubon Society. And we're going to talk about a bird just like the one over, hang on, which shoulder are we going? Over this shoulder of mine, the Carolina parakeet. Kevin Ah, oh, bird. I'm doing all right. <laughs> Thanks for being part of this this podcast that uh, occasionally has a bit of a shambolic edge. But let's uh, let's see how we go, Kevin. You're you're well known to a lot of people because you get yourself out there with a lot of uh, a lot of publications, a lot of things that you write. And I saw I can't even think where I saw it. It was probably on Twitter because I'm always trolling Twitter for for bird nets. But you've been doing some interesting research on the Carolina parakeet. And the Carolina parakeet, of course, is famous in the same way that the passenger pigeon and the dodo is famous. What is it, Kevin? What is the Carolina parakeet? Yeah, it's extinct, uh, right? <laughs> right, yes, it's extinct. Oh, I, <laughs> like it's a parrot. It, it's like the Monty Python Norwegian blue. It has ceased to be. Right. (laughs) Now, how common were they originally? Around 1800, John James Audubon said that they were pretty common within their range and quite numerous. There's some that that feel like as soon as the Europeans started moving inland, that their population started to decline. But obviously, there's no real research in that because people weren't doing point counts back in 1700. So they seem to be pretty plentiful. They were fairly nomadic. So it was really, it would be really difficult, I think, to get a a good count of the number of individuals they had. But yeah, starting about 1800 is when uh, people started to note like a, a noticeable population decline and range shift. Yeah. We talked before I pressed the go button, we were talking about the, the niche that the Carolina parakeet occupied and an interesting story about another parrot in that had has established itself in the U S but let's talk about what's known about the Carolina parakeet. What ecological niche did it occupy? Well, It's largely considered bird of the wet, swampy lands or adjacent to rivers like bottomland hardwood forests. Though they were found in farms and everything like that, they seem to stick to right around the water. They're closely associated with a number of different plants, the cypress in the southeast in the swamps there. They also would eat sycamore balls of sycamore trees. And they would, there's a few like toxic weeds that they were closely associated with that that they could eat and and not actually get sick from there's some anecdotal stories of people's cats or or pets eating one and dying because of the toxicity that had built up in their system from eating these toxic weeds but as far as a niche is concerned they seem to be unique in in north in north america in that they they were a parrot a we only had one other a parrot native to the, the area that is the united states now which is since been extirpated and now only exist in Mexico. So they were unique. As you can imagine, the the colonial settlers coming in and seeing this really beautiful green, yellow, and red parrot was probably pretty, pretty interesting to see. But they were largely a creature of the forests. And well, we can, I guess we can get to the monk parakeet next, but I think that's a, a distinguishing uh, characteristic of them. The question really is what what caused the decline was it land clearing habitat loss were they being persecuted for any reason what was the sort of triggering point for the decline of the population i mean it's all of the above 
really. It's one of the subjects of the research that I've been doing over the last, it seems like, a decade or so. Is trying to figure out why they went extinct or how. And it's really hard to study species that weren't very well studied during while they were here, as you can imagine. And there's not a lot of data that exists from 1800 that would help do any kind of correlative study on the drivers of their extinction. But anecdotally, and based on the research other people have done and their, their hypotheses, there's four major ones. There's habitat loss. There's, they were routinely shot as crop pests, especially in fruit orchards. And there's a very kind of lurid story that Audubon relates about a farm, an apple farmer just shooting them. And because they're parrots and they're social, their calls of alarm would bring in more parrots. And I, if, if I remember correctly, they, the farmer just eventually stopped shooting them because he was just tired of doing it because he had shot so many. And I think that story in and of itself has led many to believe that we hunted them to, or we shot them to uh, um, extinction, which I don't necessarily think is true. It certainly didn't help by any means, but the rate at which the Carolina parakeet went extinct, you said you had relatively healthy population at 1800 and by 1890 or so, they were almost completely gone. They had some small remnant populations left and that's it. So in, in roughly 90 years, you went from a species that whose range encompassed a large chunk of the United States to being just relegated to these very small populations in South Carolina and Florida. And, oh, go ahead. What's always puzzled me is that so many of the world's really rare parrots have quite a healthy population in captivity. Mm. Why, why was the nation's only parrot not being kept as a cage bird? I mean, they were, but just from what I've read, they weren't really great as captive birds. I, I have to assume that, I mean, many were caught as pets, and there's one of the only pictures of a living Carolina parakeet is this guy's pet. And they clearly weren't very good at breeding, else we would probably, we might still have them. But they didn't, they just, for whatever reason, didn't seem, either people didn't intentionally try to breed them, which I can't believe is true, or they just weren't really productive in captivity, which is probably the most likely explanation. Were they, were they mourned at the time? Like, did the nation, did the scientific community at the time have a sense of loss that it was gone or... or or did no one really care because it was a pest species? Well, uh, I mean, I'm sure that I'm sure that people cared, and there was in the scientific community in the late 1800s, the, people realized that they were they were on their way out, and so they're collecting them intensified, believe it or not, because they I think a lot of the the natural history museums were like, oh, we need to get them while they're still here and have some in our collections. So you see... <laughs> Let's preserve them by sh by killing them. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think at that point it probably didn't make much of a difference, again, but it certainly probably didn't help any. But yeah, so you see, if you're looking at the history of, of the records in of specimens in museums, so you see a kind of a slow increase over time. And then when you see 1890, you see a sharp increase where I think, I, I can't remember how many off the top of my head, certainly uh, a big chunk of all of the specimens we have were collected after 1890. And there was a, I think, and I'm not entirely sure why 1890 was the big year, but there was a publication at the time that showed the historic range of the Carolina parakeet in a, it's in a ornithological journal. And then where the author thought they were left in 1890, what population pockets were left. So that may have spurred people on to realize that oh, wow, these things are going there. I mean, and there's a lot of uh, controversial sightings. So they were officially deemed extinct in 1920 because that's the last 
recorded sighting of them in the wild, the last non-controversial sighting of them. However, there were sightings of them up until the late 1930s and maybe even one in the 1940s. And the most controversial ones were in South Carolina and the lower Santee River. And they were seen by like professional field technicians that were out actually looking for ivory billed woodpeckers. And they encountered the Carolina parakeets routinely leaving this particular tree. So they called in someone from Cornell, one of the professors there, and he went down and said, oh yeah, they're there. But he later then recanted and said they were probably uh, morning doves. So, and so therefore they, the validity of those sightings were called into question. So suddenly it's as if they weren't seen there, but as to the mood of the country and their passing, I do know that the passing of the last captive Carolina parakeet, which was in 1918 in a cage uh, that was also occupied, occupied previously by the last passenger pigeon in captivity who had died a couple of years before. So that bird died in 1918 alone, and it is the, the last captive Carolina parakeet. So, and I, I get a sense from reading about it that it was at the time a big deal, but, but yeah. Eskimo, Eskimo curlew, passenger pigeon, Carolina parakeet, ivory billed woodpecker, mm. and all contemporary. Yeah, also Can, the heath hen as well. Oh yes, yeah. Can the can human disturbance be tied down to the demise of all of them? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I as far as this passenger pigeon, I think it's pretty well established that we were yeah. the the cause. But as far as the, I, I actually don't know that much about Eskimo curlews. I know the heath hen was we just essentially destroyed their habitat, and then we put them all on an island, which caught fire and killed the rest of them. So that was not a very good management, but people were trying, which in the late 1800s, early 1900s is something. But as far as the Carolina parakeet is concerned, it's, it, I, I mean, I think it's safe to say that we did either directly or indirectly or both have a hand in their demise. I mean, we were destroying some of the habitat they lived in. We were persecuting them. We were collecting them as pets and, uh, you know, and also collecting them for their feathers for the millinery trade. But I mean, I think the prevailing hypothesis about what was the main driver of their extinction is disease. And just because, I mean, I think there's no real evidence for any of these necessarily that we can find, but given the rapidity at which their range contracted over time, it, it, in my mind, and other people who have focused on the Carolina parakeet before me have said it, it had to be disease. I don't know which one, but so some of the ideas out there is that with European settlement, we brought domesticated chickens and, and everything like that and, and ducks and geese. And the Carolina parakeets were not, not, they were found in farms. They would actually roost in barns. So they, they didn't seem to have a problem with farms, but they became in close contact with all these domesticated you know, European birds. And it's possible that that proximity spread some disease that they're not, they weren't prepared to deal with and caused problems that way. But there's some anecdotal observations of Carolina parakeets going, entering what they called what was it, apoplexy back then, which is seizures. And, but without a lot of specimens that have been fully preserved specimens that aren't just their skins or skeletons mm -hmm. and the DNA technology to go in there and try to take and find if there's any kind of bacteria or viruses that are found within their bodies. And given there's so few of them, it's certainly possible that the ones that were collected just didn't, weren't sick, but the rest of them maybe were. So there was a uh, paper that came out, a uh, research paper that came out about a year ago where they tried to sequence the genome of the Carolina parakeet based on a specimen that they had in their collection, which had no date or location where they were, coll were collected. And based on their analysis, they said that they, there was no evidence that disease had affected the population from wherever the bird came from. I mean, it's certainly possible that bird was collected before disease hit it or, or 
for whatever reason, it, that one individual just didn't have any kind of signs of disease or whatever. I mean, I'm not a genomicist, but it seemed pretty shaky to me to say that disease was not a factor in their extinction. But yeah, that's all the, oh, there's actually one more hypothesis, which is an interesting one about how they went extinct, which is another indirect human cause, which would be competition with uh, European honeybees for roosting spots. Uh, so the Carolina parakeets would roost in trees and like snags and trees. And so the idea is that the bees would force them from their roosting holes. And further, the trees that had all these holes in it that were good for roosting for both the birds and also for the bees to build their nests, that these trees were cut down by honey hunters that were would cut down the trees to get at the honey. So I, I don't see that happening on a wide enough, uh, I don't know. It would be have to be an incredibly concerted effort to do so. And I don't know. I mean, certainly I wasn't well, there, but it doesn't were seem. They, were, were they hollow nesters? Yes. Yep. So, well, at, at a time with great expansion in the country, the reduction in trees that were mature enough to have hollows was probably an ancillary factor as oh, well. Sure. I mean, the, yeah. I, I, I was unaware of the competitive pressures with the honeybees, but that's, I wonder if that carries on over here because hollows are at a premium here with so many parrots and, and owls and whatnot, possums and whatnot that we've got here. Uh, hollows are a big issue because there aren't, well, the good timber trees get cut down and then it takes 100, 200 years to produce more hollows. So, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. It just seems like there's everything was conspiring against them, <laughs> essentially. Yeah. How many intact specimens roughly are there? De do you know, are there many possibilities to do more genomic work? So they use the study skin. I believe they use the toe pad. I don't remember. Oh, sorry. Here's my cat. They, so there's roughly, there's between seven and 800 specimens in, in different collections around the world. And there may even be more. I actually was emailed by somebody who lives in Canada that bought a specimen in a, a antique shop. Just, they had this Carolina parakeet specimen. I, I forget how much they bought it for, but it was like a hundred bucks or something. And I was like, whoa, I mean, it was beat, it, like the head was falling off and everything. But I'm like, you could probably bring that to a taxidermist and have it fixed. Yeah. And I'm like, man, how lucky were they? They found a Carolina parakeet taxidermied mount for in an in a antique shop. So who knows how many of them are out there? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm amazed. A, a hundred bucks. I can't believe that. I would have thought there would have been a real premium on that. Camera shy, your cat there, Kevin. Oh, yeah, very. <laughs> Taking residence right there. Um, yeah. That's great. Were there, you, you talked about the Carolina parakeet eating toxic plants. Now, were they, I mean, when we think about parrots, we think about granivores, seed eaters. Now, mm -hmm. Parrots like flowers as well. What do we know about the wild dietary habits of the Carolina parakeet? Oh, I mean, they were similar to most parrots. They, I mean, they would eat the seeds of the cocklebur, which is the plant, the, the, and which, so the, yeah, they eat seeds and there's some uh, stories of them when they're attacking apple orchards that they wouldn't necessarily eat the flesh of the fruit, that they would go for the seeds in the apple. So you can imagine that uh, a bird that's in your orchard that's just throwing away the, the actual fruits just to get at the seeds inside would probably aggravate some folks. So it's probably a contributing factor why they were uh, shot in orchards. But yeah, they, they had a pretty typical uh, parrot diet. They also, like I mentioned before, they ate sycamore balls. Only one of two North American species that eat them. The other is the evening grosbeak, and you need a big tough beak to get into those things. So yeah, and, and so that, yeah, they just had a pretty typical seeds diet. I mean, and we don't know, a lot. I mean, obviously we don't know a lot because they weren't really systematically studied. It was just basically where people saw them and that was about it. So was the Carolina parakeet a conure? Y yeah. <laughs> I mean, to me, like the distinction between parrot, parakeet and conure is, is 
cloudy at best, but they're most close related species are the sun conure and the nanday conure also named nanday parakeet and sun parakeet which are you know largely considered conure so yeah 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 i was just trying to get an idea of where they fit in 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 the family mm-hmm. tree with the parrots because i mean parakeet's a terrible word i mean it gets applied to so many of the australian parrots which are not remotely similar to parakeets from other parts of the world so yeah it's just means parrot to me small right. parrot maybe yeah yeah it's it's interesting like people ask me all the time what the difference is between the two and one of the species that i have studied the monk parakeet like in in science we call it the monk parakeet but in the pet trade they're called quaker parrots i'm like mm. it's the same species but some people call them parrots some people call them parakeets mm. It's the it's not quite arbitrary, but it's almost arbitrary in some yeah, cases. Yeah. Well, that's right. That's why common names are, uh, are dangerous things. You mentioned the Quaker parakeet or the monk parakeet or the monk parrot. Let's <laughs> let's diverge a little bit. You were telling me a nice story about the monk parakeet. Well, a, a, a tragic story, but a nice story about how people, um, well, people like parrots, so. Let re- recount that story that you told me earlier for the listeners. Sure. Yeah. You'd asked me like how I started studying the Carolina parakeet because uh, it's not normal. Well, I mean, it's not most ecologists study stuff that's still alive because you can go out and collect data. So for me, yeah. I would, what, I, what's the difference between an ecologist and a paleontologist? <laughs> no, then. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I could be considered a historical ecologist too. And that's, I guess that would bridge the difference between the two. But so I was doing my undergrad research on the monk parakeet and they, in especially here in the US and, and elsewhere, they build their nest on utility poles sometimes. And sometimes those nests catch fire and cause power outages. So utility companies around here don't like them on their poles for understandably. So here in Connecticut, back in 2005, one of the local utility companies caught a bunch of them to try to get rid of them from their nest. And they're not, they're, they're not indigenous to the United States, so they're not protected by any laws. So they could catch them. So they handed them off to the USDA, which is a government agency, a federal government agency here. And they That's use the Department of Agriculture. Yeah, dairy and, ar- and agriculture or something like that. Yeah. I should probably know that, but I don't. So, so they euthanized them. And that led animal rights activists locally and also more nationally to really focus in on the species. And it was really, there were death threats, there were lawsuits, there were protests, that it was really hairy. So the utility company backed off. And so I was trying to figure out, but the birds were still nesting on the poles. So I, my research project was to look at how do they nest on the poles and is there a way we can intercede so that the birds can't nest on the poles and they can just go and nest in the trees like, like normal. But the, a lot of what I was hearing at the time were people who wanted to protect the, the like wanted legislature to, to protect the species, kept saying that they were taking up the niche left vacant by the extinct Carolina parakeet. I guess their argument was, well, they're both parrots and they both can yeah. live in the cold. So therefore they must be interchangeable, which as you and your listeners knows is not the case. I mean, no, no birds are exactly alike. And with the case of the Carolina parakeet and the monk parakeet, they, if you look at their distribution in North America, the Carolina parakeet, as I mentioned before, is a forest, a creature of the forest, whereas the monk parakeets are creatures of the plains and shrubby habitat. And so if you look at their distribution, they're almost mirror image, they're almost like a negative of one another, Mm. where the except in florida the monk parakeet is just in very urban and suburban areas along the coasts and some in texas and everything but on the east coast they're just in like right around the coast whereas the carolina parakeet was is more of a forest species i mean they did live along the coast in south carolina and florida but at the time those were very forested areas so to me and i looking at the biology and the behavior 
it was clear to me that they're not the same thing. Not all parrots are alike. Even if they have similar diets, they may not eat similar. For instance, here, uh, among parakeets, we will eat dandelion flowers like, like all the time. And it's funny watching them do it. But would have Carolina parakeets eaten dandelion hens? Maybe. I don't know. We so yeah, know. right. So to me, the, their, that argument was not really a good one for protecting this species. In the end of the day, there's just, I think the pressure that these utility companies were knew that they would face if they started trying to continue to catch these birds made them back off and they, and they were just starting to remove the nests outside of breeding season just so they didn't get big because monk parakeets can continue to build on their nest and build like these huge apartment complexes where there's multiple couples in this big nest. Even here in, in Connecticut, some of the nests got up to be like 15, 20 feet in diameter. So, that, I mean, they can become really substantial. So that's, and so when in learning more like about the Carolina parakeet, because when I first started, I had no idea that the U.S. had native parrots. And so it really just got me interested in it. And then I started reading more about it. And I was reading Lewis and Clark's travel diaries, which is for listeners outside of the U.S., Lewis and Clark were famous because they were basically told they, to go ex explore the West and report back. It wasn't their task to delineate the, the northern boundary of the U.S.? I don't think it was. A, they didn't go along the northern boundary. I think they were just told to go explore because we had... Uh, see if my U.S. history is very good. We had just made the Louisiana Purchase not long before, and, and they wanted to report on what was out there. So that I could be wrong, and your listeners may think I'm an idiot, but but it, that's my recollection uh, of, yeah. of why they were out there. Yeah, I, I read an account once about Lewis and Clark, and they were apparently very different personalities and one of them was a stickler for detail and the other one was a bit a slipshod I think was was the story I got told but but I, I seem to remember in that northeastern part of the US that you've got a little bit of a wavy line whereas the other part of the boundary with Canada is a straight line yeah mm. yes and yeah. and I think that wavy line was the work of Lewis and Clark okay. so yeah, I think I, I, I could be completely wrong, but it's about the only bit of American history that I've read and retained. And yeah, but there is yeah. a great a great song about Lewis and Clark. What song is that? Looking for Lewis and Clark. So oh, really? Um, you, hmm. you can check that check out on check that out on YouTube. Looking for okay. you for Lewis and Clark. All right. Which is the only reason that I even know who they are. I thought, <laughs> who the hell are Lewis and Clark? Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you're not from the U.S., you probably wouldn't know <laughs> and or care about them. But they were really, despite the disparity between the attention to detail between the two, they did leave very detailed notes, or at least one of them did. And uh, so I was reading about the Carolina parakeet. I was reading about the specific sighting of them in what's now Nebraska. And at this at this town of that the Native Americans had put together. And they were staying there and they saw Carolina parakeets. And I said, you know, to myself, I'm like, I bet you I could find where that is now, like on a map. I could get geographic coordinates for it. And so I was able to. And then I realized that I could do that for all kinds of observations and and build a data set to look to explore different things like their extinction, what their actual range was, did they shift their range, also look at when they actually went extinct, because it's to me it was unclear. So that's based on this just random me just reading about it and saying, hey, I bet you I could get some data from this. I was able to do quite a bit of research using that data set on trying to figure out all these different things. So it was a good, a happy accident. But yeah, that's how I collected data to study an extinct species was by reading all these really old books, these travel diaries, and just going through and finding any time somebody mentioned seeing the bird and with enough information about where they actually were to figure out their coordinates and that the difficult thing about it is i'm sure this is similar in australia is over time these towns get bigger some of them disappear even rivers change course in yeah, the rivers of, shift roads shift right yeah. so, so trying to find exact 
coordinates or very close to exact coordinates of, of a, a ghost town in Florida from 17. 17- you know, 80 or a Spanish fort in 1680 or something like that. It was really, it was fun. I actually quite enjoyed it. I learned a lot about our country. Apparently not a lot about Lewis and Clark, but a lot about our country. (laughs) Well, I've got a Lewis and Clark question for you because I want to tie it it in with Australia a bit. Now, Lewis and Clark came back, didn't they? Yes. Okay. Our famous explorers who were known as, as a pair, Burke and Wills, they set out, they didn't make it back. So, oh, okay. <laughs> the country claimed them. So, oh, okay. Uh, yeah. And we had a, we had another one too, Lud- Ludwig Leichhardt. He he headed out. He was heading west. Never heard of again. <laughs> so, oh wow. <laughs> so, he remains in the as a historical character, so his memory stays, I guess. We have a federal electorate named after him. Yeah. So. No, he before he disappeared, he had done a lot of work. But yeah, he went off on his. He was going to cross the country, never heard of again. So um, now, Kevin, what did your work attempting to reconstruct the range and identify where these anecdotal record records were? What what did that tell you about the bird? What did you learn about the bird that? <laughs> that wasn't over before. For those of you listening, Kevin's cat has just done some acrobatic moves directly in front of the camera. That's fantastic. Yeah, she's a ham for sure. Yeah, so what we learned, so back when they were living, the way that they estimated like range size, at least in this case, was essentially to take a, a black magic marker and just draw a circle around all of the most extreme sightings of the species. So for the Carolina parakeet, there were some questionable sightings on Colorado, which is a little bit west of the center of the United States, and also up in upstate New York, which is up in the Northeast. But there is only very few records of them there. And, and so you were looking at this huge range, they're like, oh, the Carolina parakeet occupied like half of the United States based on these range maps. But they really didn't because they were never seen in any of the mountains. So in the eastern part of the U.S., we have the Appalachian Mountains. In the south central area, we have the Ozark Mountains that were, according to these maps, they were there, but they were never seen in the mountains at all. So what I did was use the, all the data that I collected, and I, I think I ended up with over 800 different observations or records of specimens being collected. Use look use some of these models to predict where was the area most suitable for them, based on where they were and where they weren't. And we found that their range was way smaller than previously believed because we looked at where they actually were. And what habitat was similar enough to the areas that we saw them that was likely that they were there too. And it was much smaller. But we also found that uh, that they shifted their – one of the subspecies, there's two subspecies. There's the one in the southeast and one in the, the northwestern part of their range. The one in the ne- northwestern part of their range shifted their range during the winters because the winters in the Midwest of the United States are very bleak. They're, everything's flat, so the wind is just cutting. So we found that they shifted in the winter in a southeasterly direction to get away from the worst of the winters. I mean, they're still parrots, right? And I actually lived in Nebraska for three years when I was in the Air Force. And I, if I had the choice, I would have moved southeast too <laughs> during the winters because it was they were just brutal. So we found that. And we also found in this paper I actually just had accepted, their extinction date was likely in the 1940s. But we also found that the two subspecies went extinct 30 years apart. So the Western subspecies, which was much larger in range, went extinct 30 years before the Eastern subspecies, which I think is really interesting and could potentially be an important clue in trying to figure out exactly what the drivers of their extinction were rather than just, yeah, it was probably all of them, maybe disease. So, So I'm really excited about that particular finding. Have you got a pet theory about what drove the rapid or the more rapid extinction of the Western subspecies? Well, I do have a, a, I mean, this is obviously more kind of just 
it's making conjecture. Connection. Yeah. Conjecture, yeah, yeah. I'm, so, not, I'm not holding you to it. All right. I'm not putting so, your professional <laughs> reputation on the line here, Kevin. Good, good. So I, I actually I did write a little bit about this in this paper that's coming out soon. But uh, the Western subspecies uh, were known for congregating at what we call salt licks because salt was not very common except at these particular areas in the Midwest. Whereas the southeastern species lived along the coast, so salt was never an issue for them. But my feeling is if it was disease that the fact that all these birds would fly from all around to congregate at these would be, those would be ways that they would transmit it. And then the birds would fly back to their, wherever they were and infect any of the ones that didn't go. That, I mean, to me, that makes, at least makes, seems intuitive, uh, I guess. That's a a reasonable working hypothesis, I think. Yeah. But how to test it? No idea. (laughs) So... it's a monumental tragedy, really, and that the well, there's a couple of things I'll tease out. The, right at the start of the discussion, you mentioned that the they were nomadic. Now, were they nomadic or were they more almost migratory? I, I think they were more. I mean, the so the Western population probably were somewhat migratory in that they shifted their range. I mean, not a ton, but a little bit. They shifted yeah. their range in the winter. But I think in general, they were largely considered not, they were just, they didn't stay in one spot for a long yeah. time. I mean, well, I'm, I'm, presumably I'm guessing they're, opportun- they they're opportunistic, I'm guessing, that the they're like all, all animals who've got to follow the food. So. Right, yeah. So, like, for instance, one one really good uh, story about that, and I've written about this before, but is uh, the sighting that was in upstate New York. It was in, I think it was 1780. So right during the Revolutionary War here in in the States, uh, these birds, uh, like a flock of them, landed in the middle of, I think it was December, uh, landed on one of the houses in this small, uh, like, agricultural town. And the people there were very religious people from Germany who had never seen anything like a parrot before. And so they saw this, so they landed on the this house and they immediately thought it was a, a harbinger of the apocalypse. But it would have been a miracle from God. No, <laughs> not, they were not, not, not a doomsday. Yeah, <laughs> they're like, this is a sign from God that the end times are coming. Yeah. So the birds quickly just flew off. And since it was winter, they were probably just trying to find food. They were way outside their normal range and they were probably just trying to find food. So the next year it, during the fall, during when the town was getting ready to get their crops in from the fields, all the, the wheat and everything that they planted, harvest is the word I'm looking for. When they were getting ready to harvest, the the British and indigenous troops that were fighting for the British came down from Canada and just started burning all the crops because the crops in that area are what was being used to feed the troop, the American troops. So they came into this town and started burning everything. And the first house they set on fire was the house that the Carolina oh, parakeets landed those on. Damn parrots. Those yeah. damn parrots. So if you can imagine, like you're you live in this rural town, extremely religious. You just you think that you just saw the harbinger of the apocalypse, and then you see everything's on fire. They're shooting the town up with cannons. This is it. This is the end time. It seems like everything is being like on fire. Parakeets and their British allies. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, as they all congregated in this church and this church still stands to this day and even has a cannonball hole from that actual day in it, in the eaves of the church, it's still there. And obviously it wasn't the end of the world, but it's just a really interesting story. And it shows that you know, the birds were probably worth following the food because it was probably, maybe it was a hard winter and they were just out there, out in upstate New York for just hanging out. And uh, you, you've been to that church? I have not. Believe it or not, I actually lived really close to it. And I've never managed to get out there yet. I'm actually, one of the reasons why is I've been kicking around the idea of writing a book and visiting all the areas that they were seen historically. So I haven't gone there specifically because if I am going to write this book, I'd want to do it in a way that was 
organized so that I didn't just go there and hang out, but but it would be there for a purpose. Okay. okay. Take a note. If you do go to the church, I want to see if there's a stained glass window featuring the Carolina. <laughs> yeah, with the fires of hell behind. Them. That's right. That's right. It's like the harbinger of doom, the wings out, the ferocious, <laughs> the hell <Yeah>. bird. Right. <laughs> It's not, it's not a phoenix it's a parakeet that's right oh, mate i don't know oh, the, i mean well it's a sign of the times isn't it it just seems so loopy to us but that was when they were burning witches weren't they so um, oh, yeah yeah well maybe yeah. that was a little bit before then but they were probably still burning witches at that point yeah. too um, or, yeah. or stoning them at least so, yeah yeah <laughs> Now, the mythology of the Carolina parakeet is that it is the only parrot in continental US. But you've mentioned a few others, so let's talk about that sort of folklore. Sure. Now, the monk, the monk parakeet is naturalised in mm-hmm. the US, but yep. w- what's the natural range of the monk parakeet? Uh, the natural range of the monk parakeet is uh, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Brazil. And there's also a, depending on who you ask, either a subspecies <laughs> or a full species that lives in Bolivia, which is called the cliff parakeet because they usually will nest on cliffs and not trees. Um, yeah, if, if you maintain a list, they're definitely diff- different species. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, especially how hard it is to get up to the area where they live. It's, they're yeah. way up in the mountains. So, yeah, I would definitely count them as a separate species if I was listing them for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure you are. Now, down in, in Mexico, you mentioned, and I didn't my short-term memory is disappearing in my old age kevin so what was the the mexican species that has forays into the u.s territory oh yeah i actually didn't say it so you didn't forget Uh, it's the thick-billed parrot they their range used to extend uh, into the american southwest a little bit not very much are, are they basically a brown parrot with a big black beak is that yeah more or less yeah yeah. They're not especially. Yeah, they're they're a nondescript yeah. parrot, right? Yeah, yeah. No. that uh, I only know that because on Twitter, parrot of the day, oh. Oh, okay. Stephen Stephen posts posts a parrot, and I'm pretty sure I remember the thick billed parrot as just being a brown parrot with a black beak. So. Yeah, yeah, they're um, yeah, in in since uh, I think over the last. I forget exactly when, but they have since left the United States and are only found in Mexico. It's been a while, but yeah. Well, well, can we cheat that home to Donald Trump? He didn't <laughs> like any Mexican visitors. So. Right. I guess they're ex- an exemplar species for his wishes and hopes. So he did get something done apart from tax cuts for the rich. So <laughs> he got rid of the thick-billed parrot. Good on you, Donald. Sorry, Kevin. No uh, worries. When did the monk? I'm, I'm obsessing over the monk parakeet. That's because, fine. Because uh, are there any other naturalized parrots in the states? Like, have because yeah. the Indian ringneck parakeet or Indian ringneck parrot has bobbed up all over the world as a as an escapee and been very adaptable. What other parrots are hanging out in the U.S.? Oh, in Florida, too many of the name really. For instance, there there's definitely. I mean, there's so many non not indigenous species down in Florida because it's basically tropical that there's I, I know there's the white wing parakeets. There's the yellow chevron parakeets. I think budgies are naturalized down there. Oh, geez. Oh, I, I'm pretty goodness. sure. Yeah, there's just so many. There's some out in California that have naturalized. But the monk parakeet has like the Indian ringneck has naturalized all over the world as well. I mean, they're in Japan, United Arab Emirates, Israel, Rome, just all over the place. They've naturalized. They're also in different parts in the States. They're in Texas, they're in Florida, they're in Chicago. Yeah, they're, they've they managed to go all over the place. And that's largely just due to people either intentionally or unintentionally letting them out. And they just have the physiology to live pretty much anywhere. Our great Australian marauder in the parrot world is the rainbow lorikeet. Has that turned up in the States as a naturalised 
species? As far as I know, no. But, you know, if I were going to pick a species to naturalize here, they would certainly be one of them because they're really cool. <laughs> they're, they're, they're a gang, mate. They're a gang. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. They are. They're a pugnacious bully boy when, they, when they're competing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Fair yeah. enough. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they yeah they dominate wherever they are, but pretty good to look at though. Yeah, and they have cool tongues too. So yeah, I wonder is that an sort of an Australian thing with the parrots, our, our nectar eating parrots? So from your recollection, I can't think of many. I can't think of any in South America or Africa that do the same thing. I, I honestly don't know. I mean, there's 400 species of parrots. So. Yeah. I mean, there's, um, heap, there's heaps of lorries in that the yeah. Asian, uh, you know, right. Australian and Southeast Asian or the islands of Indonesia yeah. and whatnot. So, right. But I can't think of nectar eating. There's got to be. I mean, there's so much nectar in South America. You think, you you think there's so? There's got to be. I, yeah. I don't, I, off the top of my head, I don't know. Actually, I have a tattoo of a lorikeet on my arm. Oh, it's cool. Yeah. Come on, show us. It's the well, can you see? Oh, yeah, oh, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the yeah, ultramarine yeah. lorikeet. Ultramarine lorikeet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I now, just which, think. Uh, it, I'm trying to think which island that was from. Oh, jeez, I did know that information, but yeah, I, have, I used to too. I yeah. used to too. I also um, have a Carolina parakeet tattoo right here. Yeah, that one's pretty wicked. That yeah. one's pretty wicked. You've had someone take professional photos of that kevin and for some photography book or some tattoo book oh uh, not yet but maybe it needs yeah. there's a few areas that need to be touched up before i think it's ready for that but yeah it's, it's pretty wild pretty wild unfortunately podcast not being a visual medium kevin people are, people are going to have to visit the website and and track down the video <laughs> yeah <laughs> what's your favorite parrot my favorite parrot is the bald. I'm bald, so that's part of it. But it's also the most recently described parrot species. Oh, yes, you are also bald. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I, I, I'm rocking the fryer tuck look, man. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm just shaving it all. It's just easier. It costs less money because I do it myself. But the yeah, the bald parrot was described I don't know, like 20 or 30 years ago. And the reason why it took so long to figure out they were a, a species is because their range overlaps with the vulturine parakeet, which they both have no feathers on their head. They're both featherless on their heads. But the vulturine parakeet has a black head and the bald parrot has an orange head. So for a long time, people just thought that the bald parrot was just a juvenile version of the vulturine parakeet. But back, the date escapes me, I don't know if it was in the late 80s or late 90s, that somebody found one that was sexually mature and was like, holy crap, this is a new species. It's a completely different species. So if you, look, if you Google them, you'll find it's just this really odd looking green parrot with a bright orange featherless head <laughs> it's super cool now watchers of the video will know what i was just doing i was googling the bald parrot <laughs> and it's pretty good the list of what comes up bald parakeet bald parakeet head bald parakeet spot head <laughs> bald parak parakeet bald spot <laughs> parakeet <laughs> bald spot back so i have to click on bald parakeet head mm -hmm. and Gee, I'm not, I'm not getting any great visuals. Yeah, it, because you're probably getting a lot of people's uh, pets that have lost. Yeah, and half of them yeah. are budgery gars. So that was a very unsatisfying Google search. Wow. <laughs> and uh, the, the cool thing about them not having feathers on their head is they're similar to vultures in that way, where they don't also don't have feathers on their head. And I mean, you probably know why vultures don't have feathers on their head because they're eating gore and they don't want like this festering. It's just hard to clean out of feathers. Yeah. But the vulturine parrot and the bald parrot, the reason why is because they eat a lot of sticky fruits and it's the same thing. It's really hard to clean out of your feathers. So they evolved over time to not have feathers on their head. But it's always eerie seeing a, a bird without feathers on its head because you can see its ear hole, which is, yeah, it's just... <laughs> Yeah, it's just not, it's very off putting in my opinion. But I mean, they're not lookers, are they? I mean, no, they, 
But, I mean, just check out a cockatoo that's the victim of beak and feather disease and and you'll see from one handsome, majestic bird, they are really one scrawny, ugly <laughs> mother. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> yeah. Um, Kevin, what's what's next on on the on the project on the Carolina Parakeet? Have you got much still to do? I, I think, yeah. I mean, there's a lot left to do. I mean, the thing is that I'm doing a completely different job now, so it's I don't have a ton of time to devote to it. Though I do still spend some time on it, but yeah, trying to figure out a way to categorize their range contraction over time as a potential way to learn more about their extinction process is really what's next. Uh, I tried to do a little bit of that in my PhD dissertation, but I'm not quite happy with the methods that I used. And I think that as our ability to model becomes more sophisticated, that eventually there'll be a method that comes out that I can use to put my data into and try to figure out, uh, get a better idea if it was disease or if it was habitat loss or all of the above. In trying to find these preserved specimens, like full specimens that are preserved in like alcohol and trying to figure out a way to do the genetic work to see if we can find disease on any of these uh, specimens would be, in my mind, probably the next avenue of research. Because the thing about it is I've been told by some folks that what I do is a waste of time with the Carolina parakeet because they're extinct. As far as I know, they're not coming back unless someone tries to do some Jurassic Park stuff. But where, where is the crazy uh, lunatic billionaire when you need them? Oh, that's yeah. right. They're in space. <laughs> yeah. So people just said you could spend your time working on something that's still around or endangered that, that could actually have some real benefits to conservation. And for me, I mean, sure, I get that. My, my hope is that learning more about this particular extinction of the Carolina parakeet. So if you think about the pressures that they were under, where it was a largely forested rural country before white settlers came and then the everything just started they started clear cutting forests for farms and everything and rapidly industrializing and, and then we see the disappearance of the carolina parakeet could basically in concert with the expansion of agriculture and industry in, in this continent and if you think about the developing world that's largely undergoing the similar pressures where clear cutting forests for for grazing and agriculture, introducing domesticated poultry to areas where they have never been seen before and, and potentially introducing uh, wild species to these zoonotic diseases. It's there. And, and parrots, generally speaking, are tropical species that live in a lot of these areas that are rapidly industrializing and becoming more rapidly agricultural. And so if we can figure out what happened to the Carolina parakeet, like for instance, if it was disease introduced by chickens, that may have an impact on how people introduce these species in, in other areas around the world. And that, I mean, that's what I used to justify to myself anyway. That well, we could it, potentially it, learn something that would help other parents. If we understand each individual extinction story, we stand a better chance of not replicating it in another species. That that that's what I think. There's obviously value, I, I think, in 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 what you're doing. Yeah, I do understand that if people think that your particular skills should be applied to a species that's still alive. Well, there's an argument for that, but I'd be saying, hey, there's plenty of ecologists and ornithologists out there. Fund, just fund someone to do the work right. if you want the work done. Yeah. And, and some of the modeling work that me and my colleagues have done around Carolina parakeets could potentially be used to explore areas of threatened or endangered species that may we may not know where these remnant populations are, but these modeling techniques can help identify potential areas where the birds or other species still exist. So there's that as well. So, so yeah, to, to me, it's, I mean, really, I started studying this extinct species out of 
just interest uh, in, like I said, that story of finding Lewis and Clark and, and everything. But really, part of it for me was at the time, I was trying to figure out what my PhD dissertation was going to be. And I, my ex-wife and I had our daughter my first year of my PhD program. And I ended up being my daughter's primary caregiver because my ex-wife worked a lot. And so I needed, so my dreams of going around to try to find the night parrot out in <laughs> out in the grasslands of Australia or hack through the jungles of the Amazon were dashed that I wasn't going to be able to do field work because I was taking care of my daughter. So I needed to find ways to collect data that I could do while I was, while my daughter was taking a nap for instance, and reading about the Carolina parakeet was a way to do that. So that's, I mean, that's probably as much of a reason why I studied in the extinct species as anything else. Uh, well, just, well, you would have been uh, devastated to learn that the night parrot's nowhere near as rare as mm. we thought. Um, yeah. The, go the ghost bird is out there and... Uh, <laughs> There's a lot more ghosts than anyone knew. I'll be talking to people about the ghost bird coming up soon. Oh, cool. Kevin, there's, there's recently been some pretty cool work uh, done on them. Now, yeah. now, are there people out there who are maintaining the belief that the Carolina parakeet is still out there just waiting to be found? <laughs> I, I do get occasionally emails from folks that claim they see them in, like, very rural parts of Mississippi and Florida, but it's way more likely that there are just other parrot species. For instance, the sun conure looks very similar to the Carolina parakeet. So it's certainly possible that people are seeing those. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if there's a lot of people out there that still think they're around, but I guess there's some that do. Another interesting little anecdote about the kind of the lore of the Carolina parakeet is there was an ornithologist named Oscar Bayard, who lived in Florida, and he claimed that he knew of a remnant population, but he refused to tell anybody where they were because he knew the minute he told people they were going to go there and try to collect the specimen. Yeah. Either. Because at that point, I'm sure having a pet Carolina parakeet or selling one would be, make you a lot of money, just like a lot of rare parrots and poaching. But he died. And the researcher, I guess the that really focused on them before I started. Noel Snyder actually went and tried to find the family to see if they he could find that journal in his effects after he died, but apparently he couldn't. So, so yeah, so the, I mean, who knows? I mean, stranger things have happened, but I highly doubt they're still out there. Well, while, while we're, we're drawing long bows, ivory build woodpeckers, yes or no, are they still out? I mean... I think the probability of them being still around is so low that it's essentially zero. I mean, and as just in science, we can never, it's hard to prove a negative, right? It's hard to prove that something doesn't exist. It's actually nearly impossible. So I will just say that the probability that they're still around is incredibly low as so much to say that it's, they're probably not around, but. Is there, is there much intact habitat? I mean, yeah, to some degree. I mean, it, I mean, swamps are not the easiest land to clear and turn into agriculture. So, if you looking down in Arkansas and Louisiana and even in South Carolina, these really swampy habitats. I mean, they're still it's still around. It's it hasn't completely disappeared, and that certainly, in my mind, points to habitat loss is not was a contributing factor, but probably, yeah, I think in the ivory build, they said it was like the main factor, if I remember correctly, but uh, a lot of this habitat still exists. How long it will continue to exist in its present form is another story, but like I, I could certainly see there not being enough land out there for a remnant population of Carolina parakeets to have persisted if it was just habitat that was their problem. I don't think it went away so much so that it would lead to their extinction but well kevin i think we've i think we've done the carolina parakeet to death so to speak <laughs> now uh, you, you mentioned that you're in a new position from when you started your work with the carolina parakeet tell us about your work with audubon in new york city 
Sure. Well, I just started. So after I finished my PhD, I actually went on to do things that were completely unrelated to even ecology, really. I did a two-year postdoc in science communication at University of Connecticut. And then I worked for a year at the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies in education, like running education programs and also doing education research. And now I'm working at the New York City Audubon as a director of conservation and science. And science. And so a conservation, at least to our organization, is a very broad topic. And so I oversee, not only do I oversee our actual research that we do in bird populations in New York City or whatever, but I also oversee our advocacy and policy. I oversee our education and outreach programs. So, and I also work with the communications manager on communication stuff. And so I, it's a, my job is very broad and thankfully I had the background that I did. Well, it's probably one of the reasons I got the job in advocacy that I've done over social media and in other avenues. But yeah, so my job is mostly, I have a staff that, that, so I'm mostly like the big picture person. You're the vision guy. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm still learning the job. I've only been here since March. So there's a lot about doing nonprofit conservation that I knew nothing about when I got the job and I'm quickly learning that now. But we do a lot of really interesting stuff. And I think my my conservation biologist, Caitlin, is running this program that we call Project Safe Flight, which looks at bird collisions with buildings because that kills millions of birds each year colliding with buildings. And yeah. so I'm in New York City. So it's- you've obviously been back in my archives and listened to my episode with Heidi Trudell who's oh, I uh, know Heidi yeah who's 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 got one of the best handles on Twitter going around just mm-hmm. save birds yep yes we're 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 big into we're big into bird strike here okay, at the cool. bird emergency so what what's being done in New York City particularly lessen the losses with bird strike each year Well, our organization before I started here was one of the big people pushing on local legislation that made new construction in New York City, all glass under, I think it's 70 feet, has to be bird safe, bird friendly glass. So that's a law. So, so any new construction has to use that, that glass. How are they enforcing it? It's one thing to write a law. It's another thing to enforce it and to put multi-million dollar penalties on those who don't do the right thing. (laughs) So I think it just went into effect. So uh, I I will have to get back to you on whether or not it's actually being enforced. Uh, You'd be calling up, it's Bill de Blasio, isn't it? You'd have to get on the phone. (laughs) No, he's on his way out. Yeah, he's on his way out. So I think he's set a term limit now. But yeah, but so our organization was like really one of the ones that spearheaded that legislation. And I think... What's next for the type of research we're doing now is we're monitoring collisions around right now, mostly around really problematic buildings, but we're hoping to expand that to do a systematic survey of bird strikes in the city and look at the correlations between like light intensity in different neighborhoods and and using the migration radars to see like all the connections between because a lot of people think that like migrating birds run into buildings at night when they're migrating which is not the case they actually the light pollution attracts the birds to the cities and then the next day when they're flying around then the, that's when they strike the buildings yeah, yeah. so so the research that we're doing is trying to figure out does light intensity factor into where collisions are most prevalent but it's really hard to study in a city not only is it like new york city huge and there's tons of buildings and everything but the around the buildings they have staff who sweep out the sidewalks in the early in the morning because they don't want a bunch of trash and everything on their sidewalks. So it, you got to get there before they start sweeping. So it's, yeah, the difficulty, there's a lot of difficulties in studying it and getting a really good idea of how many birds are striking buildings and where specifically they are. So that's something that we're really interested in. We're trying to find grant money to to do a systematic survey of collisions in the city. And we're also looking at advocating for what some people call lights out legislation, but where our organization is, it's obviously it's important for the birds. Like light pollution is a huge problem because it attack, attracts birds to 
while they're migrating to suboptimal habitat to forage it on their journey, in addition to all the other problems with window strikes and everything. But to, to me, it's not just a bird problem. It's a people problem. Absolutely. Because, it's a paper yeah, problem. Yeah. yeah. Light pollution is just terrible on human health, in addition to noise pollution and mm. just regular pollution, air pollution, water pollution. So that's, I think for us, we're going to hopefully start pushing for legislation to prevent access nighttime lighting, whatever shape and form that, you know, ideally throughout the year, but for birds, definitely focused on the you know, peak migration times. But that's all, like I said, I'm new. So this is all just thoughts that I've had in conversations I've had with my staff and everything. So you need to get a big ter- a big team of Heidi's of dead bird girls and, <laughs> and boys out there. And it's, it, it's such an obvious problem without an easy solution, especially the craze with garden lighting and with so many of them that are those solar-powered ones that they charge up during the day and then the garden lights are on all night because right. they're, cause they've got a battery and no on-off switch. Um, right. I, I used to work in a store that sold them and... We were all in on those, what, 10, 15 years ago. But gee, I regret ever having anything to do with promoting those things. It's, they're just pointless. Well, I guess they look nice. I don't turn to the well, nobody yeah. that's looking at your house at two in the morning. Yeah, well, that, that, you can't turn them off. Right. <laughs> I mean, so, so they're, they're just, they're wicked. They're wicked things, Kevin. How many on your team, Kevin? Let's see. On my staff, I have six or seven people. I have I have somebody that is like the education and outreach person. I have somebody that does a policy and a manager that does policy and advocacy. And I have my senior conservation biologist. And then I have under them a couple of field techs uh, or field ornithologists and people who coordinate like community science efforts and, and, and things like that. So... Yeah, I think that it's, it, we're not a huge organization. I think we only have 14 people, but we do, for the amount of people, we have our hands in so many different things. Like one of the things that we're starting to gear up for is in New York City and some other places, we have what's called the Tribute in Light, which is a during September 11th, there are these big beams of light that are shot up into the sky to commemorate the incident. 20 year, It's actually a 20 year anniversary. But as you can imagine, these lights attract lots of birds and other organisms. So we go up there and monitor the amount of birds that are in the lights. And once it becomes, there's too many and they start colliding, that we have them turn the lights off for a period of time to let the birds disperse before they can turn them back on again. And we do research on what we call Harbor Herons Project, but it's really the water birds of New York City Harbor. Then we look at trends in on all the little islands and everything of all these uh, like cormorants and egrets and all these other water birds that are nesting in the city. And we also do, we have a green roofs program. So we have a lot of different things going on. So every day to me is, is it's, it's interesting, but it's really hard to focus on one thing because there's always something new <laughs> that comes up. So I have to sh- switch gears all the time, going from advocacy mm-hmm. to education to all the different types of research that we do, which I like. I enjoy it, but I can imagine it's probably not for everyone. <laughs> well, it, many hats. The NYC Audubon is affiliated to the national body, but right. how does a local body like like your, how are you funded and governed? So we're essentially just a small nonprofit. So we we have a board, we're funded through grants. Member, we have a member. We're a member organization, so we have members, donations, we have fundraisers, you know, all the typical stuff nonprofits yeah. do. It's, and, and do you get a regular stream of federal or state or local government money to mm-hmm. assist in in particular projects? Yes. Yeah, that's, yeah. uh, yeah. I mean, we apply for federal, state, and city grants to do specific projects. But we certainly, I mean, we don't do any of this work alone. We partner with quite a few local other nonprofits 
and also National Park Service we work with and city parks and state parks. So in all the different organizations that do conservation in and around the city, we partner with so that I guess our efforts go further when we're working with other groups. Now, we haven't even mentioned climate change. We've talked about habitat habitat destruction and pollution issues and, right. and whatnot, land use issues, but... This is opinion, Kevin. I'm not going to. Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to hold you to to anything here. But do you think we're we're winning the war? I mean, I think. I mean, obviously not. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah. I mean, obviously not. I, I climate change is is something. When I think about restoration ecology and that whole discipline of trying to bring back different habitats to a specific point in time where they're. Oh, I, th- you know, I thought you were going down the Jurassic Park. No, <laughs> it's things are likely to change so rapidly in the next fifty to hundred years mm-hmm. that I mean, I, I think a big issue in conservation is going to be being able to reliably predict where things are going to move, where things are going to go extinct so that we can focus on preserving those areas and not necessarily the areas that are high in biodiversity right now. Ideally would be both, but our ability to predict in the future where species are going to go, it's a really complicated, and and I just co-authored a paper on all the potential pitfalls when people are trying to do this, predict a range shifts in the future and extinctions. There's so many different things to take into account. There's, if you move, say a bird has a, you know, physiological niche where they can live, persist in this particular range of temperatures and precipitation. Well, maybe their food has a much, they overlap obviously, mm-hmm. but the, the food might move somewhere else and they may not overlap anymore. How adaptable is that species from a physiological standpoint that they can follow the food, even though the food is moving outside of its comfort zone, so to speak. And there's also pathogens and parasites. They're also moving around. There's also adaptation. Are birds able to adapt quick enough? And there's some research that shows that Birds can shift their phrenology, have been shifting their phrenology already, but morphological adaptations like adapting to new food sources and whatever, they may not be fast enough to to keep up with the rapidity of the change that we're going to see. So it's just, it's, I mean, it's a mess. Like it's just a mess. And I think a lot of the predictions we're making now may not be as accurate as we'd like. Maybe they will be. It's hard to see until it actually happens. It would be great if we could do some simple models and get a really good idea of where species are going to be. But the natural world is complex. There's behavior. There's all this other stuff. There's competition. How is climate change going to change competition among species? It's, to me, it's, these are really important questions and uh, I think we're just starting to really tackle them in a cohesive way, but yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be really difficult going forward to really get a good idea of what concert, where little conservation money there is, how is it best spent? Do we continue just focus on what's in front of us now? Should we start planning for the future? And if we plan for the future, what predictions are we basing that on? And maybe those aren't going to be accurate and we just wasted all that time and money. So, yeah, I mean, thinking about it now in in that context, it's, wow, why did I get into this field? (laughs) And and it looks like we're behind the curve in terms of all the predictions that people had made about the rapidity of the changes that were going to occur. Right. It looks like we're a long way behind the the curve in our preparedness. Of, oh yeah, of, of whatever pre- preparedness there is, but geez, yeah, it's, dep- it's depressing even thinking about it. So yeah, I mean, I, I just, I, I mean, I mean, this is just we're just talking here, and this is all conjecture. But you know, I I don't know what it's going to take in order for people globally to start taking it seriously. I mean, we've just we're somewhat seeing the light at the end of the tunnel here with a global pandemic. And rather than getting people to work together, at least here in the States, it's caused more division. Something is something as simple as just, hey, just wear a mask to protect other people. Well, it's, well, I mean, it's too hard uh, to, for people to do. And uh, it's just scary that we can't even do that. 
I'm always amazed at how anything can be politicised in the states in the in the current paradigm, and the amount of people. I mean, coming from a country which is fairly sane in all of our rational in our outlooks, even though we elect pirates so often, but science denialism is such a big thing in a country which prides itself on being smart look don't even comment but uh, I, <laughs> I, I i can i don't think you should what i i just don't know where that disconnect is, has come from it's just it's mind boggling and and the fact that someone's going to saddle up for a for a second go and is possibly going to get the keys to the cabinet again is just mind boggling so, but anyway, you're one of the smart ones, Kevin. Wow. <laughs> well, thank you. Now, 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 let's let's have just a little bit more fun before you go. When you're out in the field, Kevin, what's your field guide of choice? Well, I learned on the Peterson field guide here, but I've since moved to the Sibley. I mean, I don't know if that means anything to most of it, your listeners. It, <laughs> it, well, it, it it does, but but I hope when you said Peterson, I hope they weren't going what. Jordan wrote a bird book. No, not Jordan. <laughs> Speaking no, no. of crackpots. Uh, so. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. no kidding. Um, <laughs> geez. No, no. Jordan Peterson <laughs> didn't write a field guide. No, this is uh, Roger Tory Peterson, who who's, who died quite a while ago. But he has a series of not just bird books, but he has, like, field guides. Well, yeah, God, yeah. yeah, everything to from seashells to... Uh, night stars so it's but that's what i learned on that's my first one was a peterson field guide but i since moved to the sibley and i use it on my phone and i gave my daughter my my old sibley so has she caught the bug is she a bird nerd now she is to some extent we just started birding this past winter together and she seems to really enjoy it but we also do a ton of other things we go fishing we go rock hounding metal detective panning for gold, even though there's barely any hearing in Connecticut. So we just like to go outdoors and she likes Giving anything. Giving her a good natural history yeah. introduction, good stuff. Yeah. Paint the palette. So, yeah. yeah. Well, it's all, I mean, I like doing because it's all the stuff I wish I had a kid. Like, it's okay. I can go buy a, a telescope for my daughter. I get to <laughs> go out and buy a metal detector for my daughter. <laughs> so, so have you bought a plant press? Are you pressing oh, flowers? Not yet. That I actually she would really like doing that. That's a really good idea. I, I should actually write that down. She you're, would really get out of that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> no worries, mate. No worries. Where's your favorite spot that you've been? So I think my favorite spot is is probably one of it's favorite for nostalgia reasons. It's this uh, small park in New Haven, Connecticut called East Rock Park. And it's really where I started. I started learning bird watching, you know, seriously. And the reason it's a, a cool park is because it's like a green oasis in a pretty urban environment. And it's right in the area where lots of birds migrate through. So if you go there on the right day and the conditions are right during migration, you could see upwards of 30 different species of warbler in this one small, fairly small park. And it's also, there's a, a, a hill on it so you can walk up and you can actually look at the top of the canopy of some in some parts. So you get a kind of like a eye level look at all these migratory birds. So I think that would be it. And it's interesting because it's right near Yale University. So I've run into a couple times there. He's a really big name in ornithology. And I just run into Rick Prune just hanging out. <laughs> so it, it's just, yeah. hey, what's up? What birds have you seen? It, so it's really it's an interesting place and it's probably my favorite, but uh, there's also a place in Connecticut called Hammond Acid, which is a, a beach, but it has a lot of different habitat in it. And it's a really cool place to go. Those are have, probably my two favorite places. And have you got a bucket list location that you want to get out birding? Oh God. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, <laughs> uh, this may be embarrassing to admit publicly, but I've only seen one species of parrot in the wild, and the, and that's the monk parakeet. I've never seen, I've seen plenty of parrots, but they're all captive birds. So oh. on my bucket list is to travel to actually Australia because Australia, some of the research I've done, it, it looks at the evolutionary history of parrots and where. Uh, like evolutionary diversity is highest and it's in Australia because you have so many different lineages 
that broke off the parrot line at different times that are all there, like for the cockatoos. And then, then you have the, the true parrots there too, as well. And, and different lineages that evolved over time are all found in that area. So, so while, while species richness is highest in the Amazon in general, evolutionary diversity is highest in, in Australia. So yeah, I'm really keen on eventually getting down there. I keep trying to get universities to sponsor me to go down there, but uh, so far, <laughs> so I don't have to pay for it. <laughs> but, well, uh, I think the way things are, you're going to have to get a university from over there to sponsor mm. you to come here because there ain't no money here, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> there ain't no money for birds over here. <laughs> yeah, I, I fear that it's probably pretty similar here with respect to that. So I might have to do it on my own dime one of these days. Well, if you do come over, we'll we'll get a gang together and we'll – I've got one, two, three, four, four species of cockatoo – in my in my local park, Kevin, oh, straight wow. out, straight out my front door. So. Wow, that's just wild <laughs> to think about. That's just wild. Yeah, I was talking to Steve at uh, Parrot of the Day too, and he's, yeah, you should come down. We can like, I money. <laughs> money. Now, now, look while, while we're joking around, Steve today is Parrot of the recent past. He's given up on Parrot of the Day because he's been through the Parrot. So so today he's he's posted the sound of the crested pigeons whistling wing as they take off. So Stephen's brought, broadened his horizons. And, and for, uh, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, on Twitter, if you search Parrot of the Day on Twitter, you will find Stephen's account, which is if you're a parrot lover, invaluable, totally Absolutely. invaluable. Absolutely. So yeah, do, do come on down. We'll, we'll throw another shrimp on the Barbie for you, Kevin. And yeah, no, that <laughs> actually, that would be a jaunt, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be a, yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah that would be a jaunt. And look, we could get all the parrot people who had been on the bird emergency and we could hire a, hire a cool car, a bus <laughs> And <laughs> do a tour, a parrot tour. Hey, I'm up. Yeah, for yeah. Sure. Do, do, do a do a list, <laughs> and and you guys can all furiously tick off your lists. And so, yeah, that, uh, I I probably wouldn't put my pen down. There'd be so many. <laughs> so, do you have your life number handy, Kevin? Can you spout hey, it? I can. It's embarrassing though. So so take into account that I didn't start birding until I was in my late twenties, and I'm only in my early forties now. And I've not been able to travel much because of my daughter, but it's 302 species. Now, Kevin, you are the very first one of my of my guests, and we're we're, we're we've almost cracked the the half century, I think. Everyone else I know who has been fairly far up one end of the spectrum can't quote their number. So you are at the extreme end of the bird nerd <laughs> spectrum, my friend. All right. Congratulations. You're, Thank you. you, you're now the benchmark. Oh, wow. Okay. You're, you're now the benchmark. And the number doesn't matter. I mean, that that's the way I see it. I mean, for those of you who are competitive twitches, of course it matters, but so you're out there doing it and checking out birds is what's important. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, bur- I'm building a life list for my daughter too. So uh, <laughs> hang on, hang on. Are you doing it for her or is she maintaining it? <laughs> uh, well, she's 10. So oh, yeah. she just okay. tells me that, Oh, she's, Oh, add that species. I'm like, yeah. I'll, Good. Yeah. All right. Favorite bird, Kevin. Favorite bird is probably the black cap chickadee. And yeah. what? why have you picked the black cap ch- chickadee? Uh, it's one of the first birds that I recognize their song and their calls. And they're really charismatic. Uh, they're li- these little birds. I actually have one tattooed yeah. on my arm right here somewhere. Man, man oh, man. Yeah. 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 It's, I don't know. They just remind me of when I first started birding and that feeling of everything being new and, and everything being remarkable. And I try to like maintain that attitude because a lot of people who get into birding are oh that's just a whatever yeah, that's just yeah. a sparrow yeah like who cares it's not a cool bird but they're all cool birds in their own way and yeah. and so i real i hold on to the black cap chickadee because it's extremely common here 
in in where I live. They're really cool birds and they're funny. Actually, when you coll- when you catch them in a mist net and you try to take them out of the net, they're ferocious. They peck right on your cuticle. They're tiny little yeah, birds. Yeah. And they just peck on your cuticles. Like they go to town <laughs> on it. It's they know like they're I'm not big. I'm not gonna cause a lot of damage. I'm gonna hit them right where it hurts. Yeah. Like, yeah. You're gonna remember you touched me. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I don't know. I just like them. They're adorable. They're really cool. They have cool behaviors. So yeah, it's like I said, I hold on to it just to remember like the joy of just the birds themselves. Now, you mentioned that you've put Sibley on your phone. Mm-hmm. Is Does that make your phone your essential piece of birding kit or is it a favourite piece of binoculars or is it a notebook? What? I think it's my binocular. And I don't, I mean, around here, I don't really use a field guide anymore because I know the birds of this area. There's not that many. So relatively speaking. So I, I don't really use it very often unless I see something really weird. So for me... I guess if I was somewhere else, it would be essential. But for me, it's really my binoculars. And I got my binoculars when I first started doing research. I actually got money from a, for a grant to buy them. They're uh, Vortex. And, and I used them for a long time. And then just last year, they were getting really dirty. They were getting they were sand in them and everything. So I sent it to them, and they just gave me a brand new pair. Yeah. Hey. Like, Hey, Mr. Vortex. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, and apparently that's yeah. just standard. I mean, they'll fix it if they can, but if it's, if it costs, uh, I'm guessing if it costs more to fix it than just to give yeah. someone a new one, they just give them a new one. And so that they have like, cool. Yeah. So I, it's so, so I, it, yeah, it just like holding them just reminds me of when I first started. So that, that it has that nostalgia, even though they're not the same pair, it just has that nostalgia mm-hmm. factor for me. I noticed recently, Kevin, the, was that your phone? Or where yeah, there was a, it was an alarm. I'm, I'm late for a meeting, but that's okay. Oh, look, sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's, I, it's I, fine. I just, it's um, a... I just heard some weird noise coming from my household too. I just noticed that there's some binoculars being marketed now. They're all fashion colors. That's a pretty new innovation. I mean, Binoculars don't have to be black. Did you know? Yeah, I mean, I guess they don't. It's probably better that they're not because if you drop them, it's easier to find them if they're not yeah. black, green. Yeah, I saw cool. some electric blue and some red ones and whatnot. I thought that's a uh, that's a new thing. It's a new yeah. thing. All right, last last question, Kevin. The bucket list bird. The bucket list bird. That's a good question. It would have to be a parrot. I think, honestly, it would probably be a palm cockatoo. Uh, well, very popular on the bucket list bird list, the the palm cockatoo. They they are massive. When you're up close, they are massive. Yeah. It's like they're as big as a macaw without the tail. They're just massive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, good choice. Good choice. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a lot of personality too, the, yeah. the palm cockatoo. A lot of personality. Well, Kevin Bergio, thanks for coming along on the the bird emergency adventure. It's been it's been great learning about the Carolina parakeet. Hopefully, we don't have to talk about too many more extinct birds that we can we can draw a line under those sorry histories. But yeah, absolutely. But not too confident, unfortunately. Yeah. Now, um, now, Kevin. I'm I've got a special treat for you. Uh, sure. So, so don't run away. But dear listener, <laughs> okay. that's that's all for you, dear listener today. Kevin Bergio, New York City chapter uh, of the. Uh, it, is that the right terminology? The chapter of the. We Monster are a Society? chapter, but we usually just go by New York City Audubon because we're our own thing. So. Yeah. 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 We're a distinct entity, man. That's right. Don't tr- <laughs> don't try and pigeonhole us, man. <laughs> Thanks for being with us, dear listener. I'm Grant Williams. He's Kevin Bergio. Thank you so much. See you later.